you're going to need to accept that uh, to get that uh, message off of your screen. And um, what I'm going to do um, is talk about the way this class is structured, go through the syllabus, talk about obtaining the materials from for the class, um, which is the Becker CPA review material. Um, and I'll talk to you about that process. And then I'll talk to you a little bit about the registration for the exam, you know, what the expectations are there. And then I'll talk to you about the way the exam is structured, go through some uh, study guidelines. Studying for the CPA exam is different than studying from college courses uh, because of the volume and depth and breadth of the material uh, that is contained on the exam, we're going to have to uh, really think about the strategy that we're going to be using to be able to be successful um, on the uh, various parts of the CPA exam that are lined up uh, with these classes. Um, just eyeballing, it looks like everybody here is new to my classes. Has anyone been in my CPA review classes before? You may have taken. I have. Donald, which section did you take with me? I took the FAR class. Okay. Just this last term? Uh, no, um, last fall. I see. Um, okay, a couple things then. Um, you don't have to stay for this meeting if you don't want to because you already are aware. Um, but before you go, uh, you know, you've already kind of gone through this process. But if you do decide, and you're welcome to stay, but if you do decide that you want to go, um, you didn't receive a recent email from Becker welcoming you, did you? No, I did not. Okay. Okay, good. That's good. I want to make sure that um, we don't double count you in that regard. And I apologize for not realizing uh, that you had taken it last time because looking at students that had taken it a little more recently when I sent out the email to say, come on in. Uh, to new students. So it's up to you if you want to stay, but you don't have to. Okay. okay. Um, I'll stay here a little bit, but thank you. Okay. Yeah, you'll be getting some deja vu on some of this stuff. Okay. Uh, anyone else? I took auditing with you for my bachelor's. Okay. But not the uh, 380 auditing. No. Yeah, that's fine. This was this. I mean, I may have said some of that, but you should stay. Definitely. Okay. Anyone else? Sorry, I was late. I, I'm not sure what the question is. Is that Fang? Fang, the question is, have you taken one of the CPA uh, applied classes before? I think the answer is no, right? No. <laughs> yeah. Okay, welcome. Yeah, we've talked before. Yep. Anyone else? Okay, good. Uh, now, what I want to start out doing is just um, going through the syllabus with you. So I'm going to go ahead and you should see on your screen right now, uh, pretty quick here. Well, uh, there's, trying to put it up there. I'm gonna have to lower this first. Okay, there we go. Um, you should be able to see on the screen, the e-learning page here. And uh, what I'm going to do is, and put myself into student mode partially so that it looks like it looks to you, but also uh, sometimes I discover some problems um, with how I've set things up when I look in student mode. Um, but obviously, if you clicked here, you found the Zoom meeting information, okay? Um, I'm going to be changing, taking these dates off of here. I don't know why the university seems obsessed with putting dates uh, for the various um, modules that we have, and I haven't had a chance to take those dates away. So don't worry about those dates. I'll be taking those away. Uh, but what I want to do is go ahead and take a look at the syllabus. So I'm going to uh, open that from a different location because for some reason, the way um, e-learning works, every time you click on something, it downloads it again to your computer. And I end up with, you know, 15 different copies of the same file. 
um, my download box and starts to clog up my computer. So I'm going to open it from a different place, but you should have been able to click going back to e-learning under syllabus. And if you want to follow along, mark that up accordingly for your purposes, um, that's fine. Okay. So I just want to go through this and you can see um, some information about the class. Um, it is expected that you will be in class. Okay. Um, there are not specific points for attendance, but I know that most of you will be logging in remotely rather than going to campus for the class uh, via Zoom, which is perfectly fine. Um, but there's an expectation that you are here, you're involved, you're engaged in listening to the lectures, understanding the material, um, you know, watching me go through the Becker textbook with you, et cetera, uh, and making progress towards the goal of passing the CPA exam. These four classes, 377, which is the FAR section, 378 BC. Oh, has anyone taken 379, by the way? Didn't ask that. Uh, Professor, I got a quick question for you. The syllabus says 378. Is this 378 or 380? This is 378. Okay. 380 is on Thursday. But if you want to stay for this, you can, because the only difference is going to be, I'm going to be saying 380 instead of 378 audit instead of BEC. So it's up to you. If you want to come back on Thursday, you can if you're a 380 student. Uh, we, I don't know, because when I click on when I click on the syllabus under the 378, it opens up a three <clears throat> a 380 syllabus for me. I'm not sure if that's the case for anyone else. Oh. Like on on GGU. You mean here? Correct. Yeah. It was a duplicate. It seems. Well, let me just click on that and see what we get because I can fix that. Looks like you're right. Okay, hang on. Let me fix that. That's my bad. One sec. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm in the right class. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. You're right. Uh, I, I'll fix that. One sec. So that you're seeing when you click on yours, you're seeing what I see. What I have on the screen, I should say. One sec. So what I'm going to do here under syllabus, first I've got to return to my normal role, which is person who has the power to mess things up because I actually put the wrong syllabus there for one second. Okay, and I am going to delete that one. And then I'm going to add an activity or resource. Resource file. All 2022 syllabus. Okay. Choose file. And I am going to go to my BBC class. You guys click on that. See if it'll let me upload the file and I'll have it open. Okay, good. Um, let me go back now to switch role to student. Uh, anyone want to click on that and see if you're seeing the correct syllabus now? It should be this. Anybody? Yeah, um, it looks, looks to be 78 now. Okay, good. Okay, all right, so thank you. Um, who was that that was helping me, Sam? Thank you, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, appreciate it. Okay, so uh, you could see the contact information. Uh, my office hour will be noon, um, 12 noon to 1.30 p.m. on Thursdays or by appointment, okay? Uh, so if that time doesn't work, uh, reach out to me for a different time and uh, we can uh, set that up. I have my email. I have my phone number. You're welcome to call, text, email, 
um, you know, if you email at uh, two o'clock in the morning, I mean, uh, if you call me at two o'clock in the morning, I won't answer most likely. If I do, I, if I were you, I would hang up because that probably means you caught me at the bar. I mean, caught me sleeping somewhere. So, um, you know, um, but you're welcome to call and leave a voicemail or uh, talk to me directly or text at that number. And then, of course, I think we all know how email works. Okay. Um, obviously, if you've gone this far, you know the uh, start date of the class. Last date is December 13th, and you can see uh, the Zoom link information. As I've mentioned, this class is aligned with the BEC section of the exam, and we are here to get you to pass the exam, guys. I don't know how to make it as clear as maybe uh, I want it to be. I am here to be your advocate to get you to pass the CPA exam. That's what I'm trying to do. And so I am much more, well, I am in a teaching mode. I don't want to say that, but I'm also very strongly in a coaching mode. So I'm going to be after you to do the things that I, the years of experience that I have, which I'll be talking about, are relevant to helping you to uh, passing these uh, CPA exam and particularly the BEC section of the exam. And you could see uh, the prerequisite. Okay. So again, I'll let you read through those learning objectives outcomes, but I think we've made it pretty clear uh, that I'm here to help you to pass the exam. Now, we will be using uh, Becker material, we'll be using version 4.2. Is there anyone who has received an email from Becker uh, about the um, getting the materials? I have. Yes. Mm -hmm. Really? Oh. Surprising. OK, I thought that Becker had dropped the ball on that because I never received anything from them saying we're working on this. So OK. Uh, the, professor, I have okay. a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why log in the Becker and uh, so all other three courses are 4.2 version, but only the business is only 4.1. That's the same with me as well. You don't have 4.2 available for business? For business, no. Okay. Um, well, maybe I stand corrected then. One second. Well, You say you got 4.1. Mine is 4.1. Interesting. I thought they came out with a new version for everything. Okay, 4.2. I'm just looking at my. Uh, Folks, if they recently sent me, okay, well, let me double check on that. I thought it was four point two. But maybe not. So um, I thought they had come out with a whole new set, batch of books that were all 4.2. But now that I'm looking at what I've received, it's actually, I've only received the uh, 4.2 for FAR. Yeah, FAR is 4.2. Auditing is 4.2. Regulation is 4.2 as well. Only the business is 4.1. Okay, so let me double check on that. Has anyone, re have you guys redeemed your books yet? I did. No. Okay, if you haven't redeemed yet, hold off. I think it's okay. It must be that it's 4.1 for BEC. And I thought it was 4.2. I thought they did all of them. But now that I'm looking and I've got a lot of different things being mailed to me these days, I thought they had mailed me all 
four books, a 4.2 version. Now I'm seeing on my bookshelf, I only have a 4.2 version for far up there. So uh, let me double check though. If you've ordered it, that's fine. If you redeemed it, that's fine. If you haven't um, redeemed it, hold, redeemed it, hold off and I'll send a course message with clarity on that, okay? Okay. Question on that? Is there anyone who hasn't received an email from Becker, period, to even see what's available? Okay, excellent. That's that's it. That's unusual. Usually I have some folks that have not. So, okay, good. So let me look into, um, you know, why it's 4.1 instead of 4.2. And then I got to get myself my remaining books for the other sections that have changed because apparently I didn't get that. Okay, but just by looking at my bookshelf here. Okay, good. All right, so um, that could change to 4.1. Now, um, there's other resources. I don't think tutoring is relevant here. Uh, as you've seen my contact information. Um, I'm going to be going through the um, how to study guide with you here in a little while, but um, taking a look, you can see the point breakout. I have not posted the guest speaker write-up assignment yet. Uh, I am thinking that I want to get an updated version of the um, guest speaker video. So you will be watching a video and there will be a rubric of points that I want you to respond to for that guest speaker video. Um, we have a partner from PwC who comes in and speaks to the class and uh, it won't be during our class time because we need all that time to study to go through the material but it'll be a recording of that. You'll watch that and respond to certain rubric uh, elements. It's a three page paper. Um, there are very easy things to respond to and I'm not terribly um, harsh at how I grade that, but um, the university does want me to have you doing something beyond um, just the prep for the CPA exam. Now you can see here, and I'm going to go through with you, that you will also be getting, as part of your grading elements, the uh, testing plan paper. I'm going to go through that with you today. And then um, you will also be subject to doing homework um, and the practice exams that are located in the Becker software. Um, now, let me say something about that homework and the examination. Uh, you really are on an honor system to put together a CPA testing plan, start moving towards the date that you're going to take the exam um, and um, making a good solid honest effort towards preparing for that date by going through the CPA material. Now, where I have run into a little bit of trouble with a couple of students here in the recent terms is they turn in the testing plan paper, they turn in the guest speaker write-up, and then they stop coming to class. They don't do any of the homework. They don't do any of the practice exams that are contained in the Becker software. And their answer to me is, well, I'm gonna take the exam later. And so I don't wanna do any of that. Well, I'm not going to be giving you a grade in this class for basically just turning in two documents that take you, you know, one takes you probably about 15 minutes to do, the other one takes you an hour, and then you don't do anything else uh, and you expect me to give you an A. That's not happening. So I have the ability to look to see how much of the homework you can have completed, how much you've completed correctly. I'm not going to be sitting here and you know, destroying your chance to get an A in this class because you're not 100% done with the homework or you're not 80% done with the homework or you're not getting 80% of the questions correct. The folks that run into trouble with me are the ones that when I go in and I look, I see nothing being done. 
nothing. I mean, not one single problem, not a stitch of homework, nothing. I mean, a feeble approach to going through the homework. And if I see that, then I start reaching out to you and say, what's going on? The purpose of this class is to be working through the material to help you get a sense of what you will need to do to pass the exam, et cetera. And telling me that you don't plan to sit for the exam until next year or something is not an excuse for not at least spending some time with the material looking to see how the exam test BEC uh, subjects, concepts. Is there a question on that? Um, okay. Yeah. Actually, yeah. So once we start taking the test, is there a timeline that we have to finish all four? I think I heard that one time, but I wasn't sure. Like once you start doing them, is there like a start and end point? You mean for the for the state of California requirements? Yeah. Like, is there a timeline that you have to complete it within a certain period? All there of is, and, and I'll go through that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about just for this class, but I'll talk about for the state requirements here in, in a little in a couple of minutes. But I'm just saying for this class, and it it becomes really a conversation between you and I at some point. And that I'm looking and I'm saying, well, what are you doing? You know, you're not doing any homework. Uh, some folks stop coming to class. I'm not seeing you. I'm not hearing you. You've turned in the guest speaker write up in the test plan paper and you want to check out. And then at the end, someone says, oh, I should get an A in the class because, um, you know, I turned those two things in and, you know, um, the homework you said, you know, that uh, you're not going to be terribly harsh and they think they don't have to do anything. I just want to see that you are moving towards a progress that is going to allow you to be successful at pass the exam, okay? Okay, good. Um, I probably give almost all of the grades up here. I mean, everything is falling into A plus A, okay? Folks that start to fall in here, are the folks that I have described that they're not showing up to class, they're not doing the homework, they've received emails from me asking them what's going on. Uh, and then at the end, it's all about, well, I'm not gonna be taking the exam so later, so I don't have to do anything. No, that is not the way the class works. Okay. Okay, good. Um, my background, I, uh, I'm going to go chronologically because there's enough stuff in there that the only way I can remember the different things I've done is but to go chronologically. Um, so I uh, graduated from Cal State, was then Hayward, it's now East Bay, uh, back in the late 80s. And uh, while I was in college, as you're doing, I finished up the CPA exam. I interviewed with the what were then the big eight accounting firms, um, and I interviewed with them twice and got 16 rejection letters from all eight of them um, and decided, well, maybe um, I, you know, was told, well, you got long hair, believe it or not, in those days, and you kind of don't, you know, play the game, and you're not talking right, and that's probably why you're not getting the opportunity, so I thought, well, let me go and look at government opportunities, so I got hired right off of campus with the federal government, an agency called the Government Accountability Office, GAO is the Auditing and Investigative Arm of Congress, so I spent uh, 26 years there uh, doing various financial statement audits. I am a uh, CPA in the state of California, so I got my experience uh, through the uh, GAO, because you have to have one year of experience now. In those days, it was two years of experience uh, working for a CPA in order to uh, get your license. So I got my license in working for the GAO. And around that time, I started teaching for Becker, teaching the CPA uh, review course. I started that about 1995. I am obviously still involved 
with teaching CPA review courses using the Becker material. And so I'm still involved uh, with Becker um, after all these years. So that's uh, nearly 30 years doing that. I am the regional lead faculty for the state of California, although we don't have a lot of faculty in the state of California. So I really have very little involvement in um, hiring and vetting um, CPA instructors other than those that you may encounter at Golden Gate, particularly those that teach the 379 section. I don't teach 379, I teach the other three. Um, so I've been teaching for quite a while. I started teaching at Golden Gate University in 2000 and um, sort of have floated in and out as an adjunct and then was brought on board as the director of the CPA Applied Program um, 2018, 2019. So it's been about three, four years now uh, that I've been in this role uh, with Golden Gate. Um, in 2014, I retired from the GAO. So I was there for 26 years and started pursuing teaching full time. So I was teaching for Becker and, te and working for GAO for several years, Golden Gate for a while. And then I decided to retire from the federal government and just pursue teaching. So over the last several years, I have taught at UC Berkeley, at San Francisco State, and at San Jose State. I am now retired from the state system. So I have the interesting experience of collecting a pension both from the federal government and the state government. And now I teach um, exclusively at Golden Gate and I also teach at Stanford, uh, where I teach uh, introductory to financial and managerial accounting, both for the uh, Management Science and Engineering School of Engineering and the um, School of Medicine. Both of those classes are to non-accounting majors. So that's a little bit about my background. Uh, just looking here also, I. Uh, am involved, have been involved in teaching continuing professional education classes for Becker. I help them develop their government CPE program. And I am the person on some of those videos, although I think um, as the years go by here, I'm on the video less and less. There was a time where I was the only one teaching government. Um, <clears throat> and uh, that is the case that after you get your license, if you're involved in government audits, uh, you need to obtain 24 of the 80 CPEs that are required in any two-year period to keep your license current. That's after you get your license. If you're involved in government audits, 24 of those need to be uh, government-related. And so I was involved in helping Becker get that project off the ground several years back. And as I've said, as the years go by, I'm less and less the guy on the videos um, teaching the governmental. Uh, so I've kind of pulling away from that a little bit, but I will, I, that is part of my part of my experience and things that I'm still somewhat involved in. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, you can see what we're going to be doing today, the big deals registering for the exam. We will hit the ground with chapter one of BEC. That's the chapter one in the Becker book um, next session. So we're not going to talk about business environment and concepts. We're going to talk about registering for the exam, et cetera, going through the syllabus, obviously. I'm thinking we will cover about a half a chapter per week. That will allow us time at the end to go through the final review material. So again, please, if you haven't redeemed your book yet, wait but when you redeem your book, you will redeem both the main textbook and the final review. The final review is a skinnier book. The main textbook is uh, fatter, okay? So you should be getting uh, both the final review textbook and the um, regular textbook. Question on anything on the syllabus? Well, I went through that kind of fast. Okay, good. So you can take a look at some of those things uh, on your own. So if there's no questions on that, I'm going to go ahead and lower that. And we are back to the syllabus. And um, I think the best thing for us at this point is to look at CPA exam structure presentation. Okay. 
and which you can see right there. I think I am going to open it from here because again, I'm trying to get out of the habit of clicking on it every single time and then I have 52. Um, the same thing downloaded. Okay, good. And um, CPA exam, game changer. You can see why I became an accountant because obviously I don't have much in terms of marketing. Oh, and I apologize, it says 377. It's the same thing, 378, okay? So don't worry about that, but it says 378. I mean, 377, 378 is okay. And you can see my pen is gonna do a number on me here. For some reason, I always have to go through. Okay, it's going to lock up on me. Yeah, this is the worst computer I've ever had, guys. Hang on for a second. I'm going to try that again. There seems to be this thing where I have to first try to get it to work so that it won't work, so that it will work. Okay, if that makes any sense. Okay, so accounting 378 is the same information. Okay. Um, I'm not going to go through this now because it looks like you all got this email and figured out um, how to, you know, get the uh, software ready so you can redeem your book and stuff, notwithstanding, um, you know, that we're going to see if it's, we should indeed order uh, 4.1. Uh, one question uh, with the live courses, are we doing that or are we just... Scale. No, there's no reason for you to register for a live class. You're in a live class. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, they have recorded lectures. Um, and I don't even know for sure, to be honest with you, if they would let you register for a live class with this particular package that you have. I don't think so. Um, but it, I, I wouldn't recommend it because you're going to be getting me as your live instructor to present the material there's also, um, you know, video lectures that come along with the material that I, um, that I don't recommend that you watch because, again, I'm going to be going through the book with you in a manner similar to how these live lectures or these pre-recorded lectures were. Um, the problem that I have with the pre-recorded lectures uh, that Becker produces is I feel they spend way too much time saying, now highlight this, now circle that, now write this down and very little time teaching. So I'm actually going to be teaching you the materials. I will be asking you to highlight and make flashcards and annotate your book, but it's done in a manner that's not all about just telling you what to mark up, which is what I think that they do in some of those other uh, available sessions. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and uh, you take a look at the exam structure, okay? And the first thing um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, are really the way the BEC exam is structured. And I'm gonna come back to that previous slide. I should probably flip those in the presentation, but you can see that the business environment and concept section of the exam has uh, 62, um, multiple choice questions that are contained in um, two what they call testlets. So testlet one has 31 multiple choice questions and testlet two has 31 multiple choice questions. And those constitute 50% of your grade. There are four task-based simulations and in the um, task-based simulation, um, task-based simulations two are contained in testlet three, 
and two are contained in Tesslet four. And then in Tesslet five, we have uh, three written communication requirements. And you can see that 35% of the points come from the task-based simulation. 15% of the points come through the three written communication. Written communication is only tested on the BEC section of the exam. The other exams are entirely made up of multiple choice questions and task-based simulations. And you can see uh, the accounting there as to how many questions are constituted on the other parts of the exam. Um, now, when you look at these task-based simulation two in Tesla three and two in Tesla four, um, of the four task-based simulation, only one is, uh, there, there's only one, there's always one that is not graded, but you don't know which one that is. And so you need to do an equally good job on all four of those task-based simulations. Of the three written communication, there is one that is not graded. They are simply putting that there as what they call a pre-test question to see how candidates respond to it and to see if it needs to be adjusted before they make it an officially graded question. So what starts to happen with this whole conversation here as to the number of test lists is how you will spend time. Now, coming back to this previous slide, you cannot go to testlet two until you complete testlet one. So you will go ahead and go through the 31 questions that constitute the first testlet. Then you go to that uh, second testlet when you submit the first testlet and you cannot go back to the first testlet. Then you will be in Tesla two. You'll work the 31 multiple choice questions in Tesla number two. And then you submit that. You can't go back to Tesla two. And then you're in that first task based simulation in which you'll work uh, Tesla, in which you'll work those two task based simulations there. And then in the second half of the exam, after you take a 15 minute break, the 15 minute break does not count against your time. So you get a total of four hours to complete these questions. And then you will go through and spend the remainder of your time dealing with testlet number four and testlet number five. Testlet number five, uh, even though it says task based simulation here for the BEC exam, as you've seen, it is the uh, written communication uh, requirement. Okay. Now, the reason this is all important is that the examiners, I didn't come up with this, but the examiners sat here and they're the ones that told you half of the exam is constituted of the first three testlets and the second half is constituted of the last two uh, testlets. Well, this is useful information to us because this starts to give us a sense as to how much time we should spend. Now, I've done this for the uh, auditing exam here, but for the BEC exam, let me just put BEC up in here. Okay, since they're telling us that we should spend two hours with those um, first uh, three test lists, I would advise that you spend 30 minutes on the first test list you should spend 35 minutes on the second Tesla. That now leaves us of the 65 minutes, that now leaves us what, 55 minutes? Am I coming up to two hours, right? That leaves us 55 minutes for that first task-based simulation. You should split the time evenly uh, between those two that are contained there. So now we're getting into a funky, what, 22 and a half minutes, okay? So let's just say about 22 minutes per, uh, not, what are we saying here? 27, what would that be? 55 would be what? I'm not good at math. I'm good at accounting, but not math. 27. Huh? 27 and a half. 
27 and a half. Okay, good. So let's just say, you know, 27 minutes. Thank you. Let's just say 27 minutes per task-based simulation in that test list. Now you look at this and you say, well, John, why are you giving me more time for the second test lit on BEC and um, less time, less time for the first one, more time for the second? And the reason being that the exam uses what they call multi-stage testing. So when you submit your first test lit, that test lit is going to be a medium difficult test lit. That first test lit is medium difficult for everyone. The computer will automatically grade how you have done on that particular test lit. And if you do well, the next test lit will be more difficult. So we're planning that we're going to do well on that first test lit, and we're going to give ourselves a little bit more time for that second test lit. You submit that and you do well, and that first task based simulation test lit will be a little bit more uh, difficult. So we're going to give ourselves um, the time to work through those questions. You take the 15 minute break. It's a standard break. The computer will ask you, do you want to take a break? Your answer is yes. You can go to the restroom. You can relax. Get to drink some water. Don't drink a lot of water because you know, you're know you going to then be having to dedicate the next um, two hours to completing the um, remainder of the exam, okay? And so what I'm suggesting for this, for your third task-based simulation, which is read communication, 45 minutes, that's 15 minutes per read communication because you have three of them. And then that leaves me what, um, somebody help me out, 15 plus 60, what's that, 75 minutes for these two Teslas? Am I doing that right, guys? Yeah. That leaves you 75 minutes. 75 minutes is going to be, what, 32 and a half minutes uh, per, um, per task-based simulation. Notice, again, I'm allocating more time as you move along because the exam gets tougher as you go. I'm not doing that for the uh, written communications because I think those tend to be more of a self-contained element. They don't really re return to you written communication based on how well you've done on the previous one, on the previous test lists. Question? And I go through this the first class and then I think everybody forgets about it, okay? so. You probably want to take a picture of this right now. And as you get closer to your exam, when we first start with the material, I am really um, pushing you for accuracy. I want you to get the questions right. But as we start to head into the final review and the final prep for the exam, you're going to have to start thinking about speed, timing, so that you are moving through these questions. You know, most students that are not able to pass, you know, have trouble passing a section or whatever, it's not because they didn't know the material, it's because they got to these back testlets and they really started running into a time crunch. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, because you don't know which one of these four task-based simulations and which one of the one of the written communication of the three is not graded, the tragedy is spending too much time on a task-based simulation or written communication that is not graded and running out of time to get to one that is graded. The available points in these task-based simulations, written communication are more than the maximum points that they uh, will give you. There's more points available than what they will award you. So at some point, you're just wasting time writing up a perfect answer when you probably have already maxed on the points that are available. And again, I definitely don't want you spending a bunch of time working on one that um, you know has no points associated with it. So the moral of this story, the mantra here is keep moving through these test lists, being very cognizant to the time suggestions that I'm giving you here. Question. Okay, good. Um, 
this gives you a sense as to the nature of questions that are contained in these various areas. I'm not so uh, concerned about that. Um, exam structure, okay, or the nature of things. FAR is potentially your intermediate accounting with some advanced mixed in, such as consolidations and whatnot. Uh, governmental, um, you know, if you, for whatever reason, don't end up taking FAR with me, do not sleep on governmental, do not sleep on not-for-profit accounting. That two area constitute about 25% of the points on the FAR exam and where folks tend to fall down on the FAR exam is not giving enough attention to the um, state and local government accounting. Okay, but that's really your intermediate. Audit is really your audit class. Somebody said they took my audit class, what we talked about in accounting 111, 211, or if you took the other graduate version, whatever that was, 310, back in the day, um, you're going to be having some deja vu on some of that. Um, this is the only part of the CPA exam in my mind that lines up specifically with one class that is in many uh, bachelor's programs, okay? Um, BEC is going to be all the other areas of your business degree that were not specifically accounting except managerial cost. Managerial cost is on here and uh, you'll be very comfortable with that. If you were not the best person for economics and whatnot, don't worry, we'll get you to where you're feeling more comfortable with that material to be able to get the points relevant for the BEC exam. Okay, and then uh, regulation is aligned with tax and business law. Um, and so when you get to that part, you'll have a different instructor. I'm not a tax guy. Um, some of you may have uh, get a chance to meet um, Alice Jiang at that time, if she's going to be teaching that in the uh, winter, that'll be offered in the, uh, in the spring term starting in January. Now, the suggested times you saw for each one of these, I didn't spend much, pay much attention to that because I'm going to be talking to you about the amount of time that you should be spending week to week on this material. Okay, so uh, I'll get into that here. We'll get to the how to study file. Okay, so I'm going to come back to this slide in a second, but I think it is uh, visually better for you to look at, and I put this CPA quick tip guide, okay? So you can open that and look at that again. I'm going to try to open it from my um, desktop here, because again, I get tired of having to download the same document over and over. Let me, uh, I don't want to do it that way. I'm going to do it this way. Maybe I'll open it with my annotator in case I need to write on it somehow. Okay. And uh, let's look at the requirements to sit for the exam. Okay. Now, there are three options. The options that are relevant to us are going to be either this option A or this option C. Okay, now, if you have completed the requirements that you see here, which is you have completed a bachelor's and that bachelor's has 24 semester units in accounting, 24 semester units in other business related classes, and I'm going to be showing you down here in a second the nature of the classes that would help you meet those requirements. Okay. Um, then you are eligible to sit for the exam and you should register to sit for the exam tomorrow, okay? Now, when we talk about accounting subjects for the 24 accounting, okay, any class that has the uh, word accounting in it will count. So let's say you took a class in a university or a community college that was being given in the business department, but it says introduction to accounting, that counts as an accounting. Now, if you took it from an institution that has an accounting department and the class says accounting, or the tax says the class says tax, and then it's tax, you know, 379 or accounting 379 or something like that, it says accounting, it says tax, 
it counts as accounting. And it doesn't matter if it's intermediate, introduction. For example, a person could go to 24 different colleges and take introduction to accounting 24 times, or let's say it was a three unit class. So three unit class, you could go to eight different colleges and take introduction eight different times, eight times three, if assuming those were three unit classes is 24, those would all count towards your 24. You can't take introduction over and over again at the same institution, but as, as long as you go to a different institution, as long as it says accounting or comes from the accounting department, it counts as accounting and you have to have 24 semester units. Now, if you went to a quarter school, then to figure out what your uh, semester units are, is you would need to take the number of semester units and multiply that by two thirds, and that will give you the number of semester units. So 36 quarter units constitutes 24 semester units. And if you went to schools that have different, you know, systems, some quarter, some semester, then you'll have to convert your semester units into um, your quarter units, excuse me, into semester to add them to your semester units, which is the way I, I recommend you do that. For uh, BEC, actually no, not BEC, but for business related classes, um, classes with the word business in them, economics counts as business, Finance counts as business, marketing, mathematics counts as um, um, business related classes. And I point that out because sometimes uh, students forget to count any math class you took. Let's say you were a computer uh, science major and they made you take a bunch of um, math classes and then all of a sudden you decided to switch over to accounting you could count all of those math classes, or maybe you were studying, I don't know, um, clinical medicine or something, and they made you take a bunch of statistical classes, and then you decided to switch to accounting, um, you could count those statistics classes as business classes. So you have to have 24 in the accounting, 24 in the business, along with your bachelor's to be eligible to sit for the exam. That's under Option A. Any question? Okay. Uh, Fang, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, my question is, uh, um, when should we fill out that application? If you have met these requirements, you should fill it out tonight or tomorrow. And uh, um, is that okay with we can send it to you or we have to direct send it to um, whatever we needed to. Well, I'm gonna show you how to send it to the okay. board uh, if you need my help to uh -huh. help you to figure out if you have met uh, the requirements. I'm gonna show you a worksheet that I'm gonna ask you to turn in. Um, okay. that can help you look at that if okay. you figure it out, okay? Thank you, okay. Um, but, um, if you have not met these requirements yet, but you feel that you will meet the requirements within 180 days of stay tomorrow, then, and I have to say that I am responsible for option C because I um, lobbied a member of the State Board of Accountancy for this option for our students who are getting close to graduation are taking a class like our class tonight, um, the CPA applied classes, and they're like, well, look, I'm going to have these requirements met in the next six months. And so because this is done in some states like the state of Washington, it didn't seem fair to me that the state of California CPA candidates would not have this option. And so now for CPA candidates in the state of California, if you will meet the requirements within 180 days, you can actually begin to start sitting for exam parts in advance of having meeting the requirements. So let's say this is what, uh, September. Uh, this is uh, September. So we have September, October, November, December, January, February. So let's say 
for this discussion, you're going to graduate with your bachelor's and you'll finish up your bachelor's in uh, December at the end of the fall trimester here at GGU. Well, if that's the case, then you will finish things up in what, in only four months. So you could actually sit for your exam, say, towards the end of December and sit for your BEC exam. And then once you graduate, send in your transcript showing that you completed the requirements within 180 days of the date that you applied and they will allow you to start sitting for exam parts early. That's under option C. So if you're sitting there, let's say and you're like, well, John, at the end of the spring, at the end of the fall term, fall 2022 term, I'm going to have my bachelor's, I'm going to be done with everything, then you should register to sit for the exam tomorrow under option C. Now, with option C, and this is something that is new now, this wasn't the case previously, but now they're doing this. Under option C, they're requiring, and I have, um, when I say they, I mean the State Board of Accountancy. And what I do, close e-learning. I didn't mean to close e-learning, but it looks like I have, I'm, I'm an expert at closing e-learning when I don't want to. Bring it back. Go back to student. Okay, and what did I want to show you here now? Um, right here, this certification enroll of enrollment form. Okay, and so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open that here though. Okay, and they are going to require that you do provide this, okay? And you have to put your name, your date of birth, your signature, um, the name of the institution that you are currently enrolled in, degree expected to be confirmed, expected date, okay? Now, at this time, they are not requiring that GGU fill out part two. That's going to change. So um, I would recommend that you do this right away if you're going to start sitting in advance of, say, completing your bachelor's or completing the entire 24 units. Maybe after you take this class, you'll have the 24 accounting units or the 24 business units you need, et cetera. Uh, if you are planning to complete those requirements within six months, I expect I recommend you turn this in tomorrow and submit unofficial transcripts that shows that you are currently enrolled and shows that you will be meeting these requirements or give some indication that you will be meeting these requirements within 180 days. Um, you don't need to fill out this part two. Just fill out part one. Don't worry about part two and then just submit your unofficial. You don't even need official transcripts submit your unofficial transcripts along this, uh, along with your application uh, for the exam. And apparently transcripts and poor contribution evaluations completed courses can be sent to the address below. And so you could go ahead and, and I would just submit this, um, this form along with your transcript to this, uh, I guess this is basically an email address, submit these forms to them along with your uh, application if you're going under option C. Question? Okay, so there is really no reason not to be um, registering for the exam 
uh, because you have not met the requirements yet, as long as you'll be meeting the requirements within 180 days. Now, when you fill out the CPA planning guidance document, and again, I'm gonna pick it up here. I think I'm gonna pick it up here. Maybe I put it in BC. Oh, well, I'll also put it here. This is here. Fight to find it. Okay. Stephanie, did you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I just got my 150 hours approved by the Board of Accountancy. And I noticed that they gave me credit for like a lifetime of learning because I'm 49 as opposed to what GGU ex accepted for transfer units? Um, I don't know anything about that lifetime of learning um, requirement, but the, the GGU uh, accepts units for um, transfer. There's no consequences to whether or not the board will uh, accept units. So the board, if, if you're going to, let's say you went to community college and you got units counting towards the uh, 24 semester units of accounting 24 semester units, you got some of those at community college, but let's say GGU didn't accept it as a transfer unit, you would be submitting transcripts for all the schools that you went to. And it doesn't matter if it was accepted as a transfer unit by GGU or any other four-year university. Exactly, I was so delighted. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether or not uh, GGU accepted them as transfer units. Now, one thing you said 150, and I wanna make sure it's clear that to sit for the exam, to sit for the exam, you only need uh, 120 semester units with the bachelor's. You don't need 150. 150 is for licensure, not for uh, sitting for the exam. Okay, and I'm going to get more into that okay. here in, in, when I go through this 150 uh, hour worksheet. Okay, but let's go ahead. And maybe I'll do that now. Let's, let's look at that. Okay, and this is a little different than um, and now I'm kind of violating my own rule here to Okay, I'm pretty sure I clicked on it. Yeah, it opens, but then it doesn't show you that it opened there. I guess you got to go to here to get it. Now, see what I mean about downloading things 52 times because for some reason it doesn't show me that I've opened it. But let's look at this. And, and, and Frank, this is what I was talking about. You can fill out, okay, to help you, okay? But let's just look at the summary requirements. And I apologize for this thing being a little bit scribbled up on, but um, I keep it like this because it helps me to go through, okay? So you can see that I say to sit for the exam, you have to have 120 units of which 24 are to be accounting, 24 are to be business. And you can see the nature of classes that would constitute accounting. As I said, any class from the accounting department, any tax class from the tax department, at any, whether it's at a, as long as it's an accredited school, could be a community college, could be GGU, could be another university, does not matter as long as they're accredited. And then, uh, business environment and concepts, and you can see the nature of classes as we saw in that previous. That with your bachelor's, 120 semester units, means you're good to sit for the exam. Now you say, well, what's all this talk about 150 units? Well, for licensure, 
they want you to have 30 more units. And those 30 more units, of those 30 more units, six are to be accounting and 14 can be business uh, for the 20, what they call accounting units. So the reason I put the quotes, because really only six are accounting. So if you look at the big picture, really it's what 30 accounting and 38 business that are ultimately necessary for licensure. So we're what 120 plus 21, 40. The remaining 10 units have to be in the area of ethics study. So ethics study, everyone, everyone must have a three unit class, three units, three semester unit class in accounting ethics. It is specific to accounting ethics. If you took a business ethics class, you can't count that as your three units of accounting ethics. Here at Golden Gate, it's accounting 102 slash 302 that would be the class. You could also take it from a community college. Most community colleges are offering this class now, et cetera. But it has to be specific to accounting ethics. It has to have the words accounting ethics or accounts professional responsibility in the title to count towards those three units of uh, accounting ethics. So we have 10 ethics of the remaining 10, the remaining seven to constitute the 10 classes that have these words in the title would count towards the remaining ethics requirements. So uh, if you look at this, what we're constituting those 150 units, 120, 24 county, 24 business, the remaining what? It's 78 out of um, 120, if you take the you know, 120 minus the 78, that means that 70, uh, 120 minus 78, that means that's, I mean, excuse me, 120 minus um, 48, excuse me, that remain, means that the remaining, what, 72 units could be in anything. Of course, to get a bachelor's degree, they're going to, the university is going to make you take certain classes. But as far as the state's concerned, as long as 48 of those 120 are falling into these buckets, 24, 24, you're good to go. Okay, that's to sit for the exam. When you go for licensure, that's when you have to prove that you have these additional uh, 30 units. So, Stephanie, when you say that they say you were all, you're good for the 150, I'm assuming they were telling you you're good for the 120, the ability to sit for the exam, right? I think so. Now I'm questioning myself and I want to log into my portal. Okay, that's all right. You don't have to answer that now. But I think what you were approved is to sit for the exam. You got an authorization to test. They're not going to approve you for licensure until you submit an application for license. Oh, that is absolutely correct. Yeah. Okay. Now, the worksheet, let's just look at how that works. And what I've done with this worksheet, guys, is you can put the course number in here. Okay. So, and please, when you work with this, just work with it the way I've structured it. I start getting, you know, students, they want to mess with it and move things around. And my head is geared towards it looking like this. So, you know, don't mess an old guy up. Just give it to me the way I've provided it to you here. Okay. So let's see. If you can... Really? It's not going to let me edit this now? I just don't know what's going on with my machine anymore. I guess it's decided that I can't edit this. Where it says protected view, what um, up top next to the search bar, there's a little arrow drop. Can you click that? Which one? Uh, a little bit higher up where you, the search bar is. Oh, okay. Protected okay. view. Let's see if they'll let you. Uh, Looks like it wants me to enter a password, even though I've never set this up for a password. Uh, um, hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, it's stupid. I think you guys can edit it, though, right? Can you guys edit it? Is someone open that? Are you able to edit it? Yeah. It seems to only want to keep me from editing it, the thing that I created. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting. So mine actually has a thing that says, uh, it starts off as protected and then you have to enable editing. Yeah, it doesn't want me to edit it because I created it. <laughs> okay, but I think I can do it here just to show you how it works. Yeah, okay, this one, it would let me edit, okay. But you can see here, what I've done is I put in various classes that would count for the requirements, okay? Now let's say, um, you know, I'm gonna delete a couple of these here. So I deleted this one and I deleted this one, I deleted this one and I deleted this one just for fun here, okay? Then what? Then it would show me in this example that I'm three units short. So if you have numbers in the red here, that's bad, okay? You want these numbers to be zero. These aren't gonna change. And this is 24 required, okay? And these are the requirements to sit for the exam and in the other version of the file that I can't edit. Um, there would be that purple color or whatever it was that says sitting requirements. So these are the sitting requirements. You want all of these to be what? You want this to be zero here. And then you can carry on and fill this thing out and be able to go ahead and see that you have met the requirements for licensure. And I have a heading over those that say licensure requirements on the one that we were looking at here a minute ago that it wouldn't let me edit. Um, so for those, you know, you can fill those out now, but again, they won't be uh, particularly relevant until you are actually uh, going to go ahead and uh, sit for the exam. So you can, see, I mean, uh, get your license. So you can see exam requirements I have here in purple, licensure requirements I have up here in blue. So when you fill out that CPA planning document, I want you to really be focusing under exam requirements to be able to tell me, are you eligible to sit for the exam? So now, any questions on how this worksheet works? Okay, so let's just take a look then. And when you look at that, um, back to e-learning now. And when you look to the um, CPA planning document guidance, <clears throat> it's a word file, okay? And um, what I want you to do is answer these questions, okay? Will you be eligible to sit for the CPA exam within the next 180 days? If yes, go to question two. If no, go to question four. Let's look at question two. Have you scheduled to sit or take any part of the CPA exam? If yes, go to question three. Let's just go to question three. List below the parts of the CPA exam you have taken and or scheduled. Include the dates taken or planned dates and attach a copy of your exam date confirmation. Four, if you are not able to sit for the CPA exam, fill out the 150 unit planning spreadsheet. That's the thing that we were just looking at including planned dates to take classes that you have not completed yet. So on there, if you haven't completed a class yet that you're going to need to get you up to the 24, the 24, your bachelor's, the 120 semester units, then go ahead and indicate when you plan to take those. If you are eligible to sit for the CPA exam or will be within 180 days, but are not taken or scheduled the exam yet, please provide an explanation. So your explanation may be, well, hey dude, I just submitted the application yesterday and I'm waiting to hear back to see that I have an authorization to test, or I have an authorization to test, I just simply haven't scheduled the exams yet, and I'm going to be doing that in the next few days or whatever it is. Question. Okay, now this thing is going to be due 
into me and I will be looking for this from you. There is a assignment there and it is going to be due in three weeks, 21 days and five hours, Tuesday, September 27th at 11.59 p.m. Okay, so if you are not sure if you're eligible, you just need to reach out to me, say, here's my worksheet. What do you think? Am I eligible? Yes, no. If you think you're eligible, submit the application. In the case of Stephanie, it looks like she's already done that. So um, I'm going to be talking to you about the scheduling process here in a couple seconds. And then I'm going to tell you the day that you should take the exam here in a couple seconds. Okay. All right, good. So if there's no question there, then I am going to return to this thing. And I've listed the steps out here in a step-by-step, -step, okay? But I think visually now I am more comfortable with this thing which gives you the time frames. okay? So once you are approved, okay, you have one year to select which parts of the exam you plan to take. I recommend that you go ahead and you decide to take uh, all four parts, okay? Um, now, the reason I'm saying that you do that, then you will be approved uh, you're being approved to take the exam, you go ahead and select that you want to take all four parts, then you have 90 days to pay. So you pay for those four parts. I think it's about $213 per part now to take the exam, something like that. Okay, there's an even amount per exam. It's like 200 and something bucks. Anybody know the number? It's about 213 or something like that. I think it's in the uh, handbook of how much they're going to charge you. Let me see if I can find that quickly in the handbook, which I have also um, uploaded the uh, handbook to e-learning as well. You can call the board, but they don't answer the phone anymore. If you have a question, you should probably email them. Okay. But uh, pass some of this stuff, the examination unit, parts of the exam, all of the things that I'm telling you about the requirements to sit for the exam are there, what you'll need to do to actually be able to uh, Um, when you send your transcripts, you can send them electronically, okay, and they do accept transcripts from Golden Gate, okay, and I'm going to show you um, the process for uh, applying for the exam, and um, in there, they'll give you some information about, in fact, you can see that, um, I'll, I'll show you that on the State Board's website in a second. The application fee is $100, okay? So you're gonna have to pay $100 to submit your application. Uh, if you don't fail a part, they make you reapply. Um, so, I mean, if you fail a part, they make you reapply. So that fee is $50, okay? And then we were looking for exam fees here. Okay, it's 238.15, okay? So going back to the um, sheet that we were looking at here, uh, 238.15 per part, and you have 90 days to pay that. If you don't pay within 90 days, then they're gonna make you resubmit uh, once you've selected the exam parts, if you don't pay, then they'll make you start over again, resubmit and get approved again. You have to pay that 50 bucks re-registration fee. 
Okay, so make sure you pay that within 90 days and only pay. I've told you to pay for four parts, but only do that if you think that you can complete those parts in nine months. If not, only pay for those parts that you think you can pass within nine months. I'm trying to get you to only have to pay that registration fee, that $100 one time. Because let's say you selected one part because you're saying, well, John, I'm just going to take that one part and I don't want to pay for those other parts yet. Well, to be a, able to get a payment coupon for those next three parts, you have to reapply. So you'd have to pay 50 bucks again. So if you think you complete all four in nine months, pay for all, um, you know, uh, select all four and pay for all four right away so that and then complete them within nine months if you think there's a part or two that you won't be able to complete in nine months then don't pay for it yet you will have to pay that 50 dollar application fee again but it's better than letting your coupon to take the exam your notice to schedule expire um and then you're going to have to pay not only the 50 dollars to reapply but you're also going to have to uh, repay the two, whatever it was, 38.15 that we saw there. Question on that? I know that's a little confusing. And then we had the question about the 18 months, okay? So once you have passed one part, you have 18 months to complete the other three parts, okay? So once you've completed one part, you have 18 months to complete the other three parts. So let's say I finish FAR and just, I mean, uh, let's just do BEC. Let's say I finish BEC and let's say I pass it January 1st, 2023. Well, that means that I would have until June of 30th of 2024 to complete the other three parts. If I don't complete those other three parts by June of 2024, that's 18 months then I would lose BEC and I'd have to then repass BEC plus whatever parts of the exam I hadn't finished yet um, after that 18 month window had run. And now my second earliest past exam would be on an 18 month clock running. And so most candidates should be able to get through this whole process in nine months to a year. And so there's really no reason to really worry about this 18 months. I find that students start to run into the 18 months because they get, excuse the expression, but they get a little bit flabby about working through these exams and getting them done. You know, you really need to be on a mission to complete these exams, okay? And if you do that, if you're on that mission, you're going to get them done in nine months, you're going to get them done in 12 months, and you're not going to face that danger of losing a part of the exam because 18 months has gone by since you passed that first part. Does that answer the 18-month question? Uh, yeah, I kind of have a follow-up question. So if, if sure. like, let's say we're right now pursuing a master's in accounting, is there any classes that you think we should wait to take a certain test? Um, the only class, well, I, I think you should take intermediate, mm -hmm. obviously, but if you're in this class, you should have taken at least, uh, or concurrently enrolled in 100B. So you should have gone through intermediate for FAR. For audit, um, I think it is helpful to have taken the audit class. Um, you know, what is it, 111, 211, or equivalent at another school? although it is not entirely necessary because I have had some students that are tax majors that have never taken the audit class. And mm -hmm. I can get you through the auditing exam by getting you through the 380. But since you asked the question, for far definitely intermediate, for, um, for audit, probably the audit class, but it is not nearly as necessary as intermediate for far. Okay. Um, I kind of just want to circle back to the nine months. So if I, when I, if we register for the exam and we pick all four, and so let's say we pass the first two, and then so we have eighteen months. If 
from there to before it, the first two or from the we have 18 months from the from the date of the completion of the first exam correct for us but we would still want to take all four of those tests if we select all four of those within the first nine months i don't know like where do they well, but. Okay, first of all, I'm having trouble because we got a weird audio. Um, and so uh, what I, I, I'm not sure I followed your question. So let me, let me say again, you take, you pay for all four exams. Now you have nine months to actually take all four of those exams. If you don't take all four of those exams in nine months, you lose your $238.15. Think of it this way. It's like a ticket to a ball game. And once the date of the game passes, then you lose that. You can't go to the game after that date is passed. But unlike a ball game, instead of it being a date specific, it's a date that any date that you choose that falls within that nine month window. That makes sense. That makes sense. Okay. That's the nine months. The 18 months says, for any one part, once you pass that first part, you have 18 months to finish the remaining three. So in the way you asked the question, I've passed the first one, I've passed the second one. How much time do I have to finish the other two? And the answer is you have 18 months from when you pass the first exam to pass those other two in the scenario you created before you would lose that one. If you lose that one, now you have to pass those other two plus this one before the second one's 18 month window runs. So you have like effectively two back to back nine month windows? No, nope, you have 18 months from before you lose credit for any one exam. But I mean, you have to sign up for nine months first for that first you know, set of attempts. You have nine months to um, to take any exam you paid for. So a person could theoretically, um, I guess, and maybe that's what you're asking, uh, pay for and take two exams. And let's say it took them nine months to complete those two exams. Then they could, um, reapply, have to pay the $50, pay for those next two exams. They'd have to take those in nine months and they would have to complete those before the 18 month window on the first exam ran, which is sort of the scenario you said. But I mean, that's one of a multitude of possibilities that could happen. A person could sign up for all four exams and pass take and pass all of them in nine months and then the 18 month window is completely off the table in the discussion. A person could finish all the exams in 12 months, which is what I'm suggesting. And the 18 months is off the window, out, off the table, but don't pay for that, assuming that it was a fourth exam that you had finished in the nine months because you'll then lose the 23815 and your penalty is you'd have to reapply and repay for that one part you hadn't passed, but you'd still get it done in 12 months. So no, it doesn't have to be two back-to-back -back nine month windows, but that is one way of going through it. Yeah. Question. So for people who work, um, because I, I mean I I'm working at a CPA firm right now, and in the next couple, once February rolls around, it gets really, really busy. Um, for some, somebody like me, would you recommend that I actually just maybe register for three exams and then, you know, for the fourth one, by the time I probably have enough time to take, you know, study and take the, that fourth exam, the nine month window would probably be over, right? Right. So if you're if you're in a scenario and you, you know you need to and I can help you look through that on a one by one one on one basis. But yeah, let's say okay, you're taking BEC. I'm going to give you the date that you should be taking BEC here in a couple minutes. 
In fact, I'm going to give it to you here in two seconds after I'm done saying this, but I'm going to tell you, take BEC and I'm going to tell you, take it January 4th. Okay. All right. Then you're saying, okay, fine, John, but by then I'm headlong into busy season and I'm not going to be able to restart this CPA taking mission again until, um, you know, we'll say May. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then that means that, um, you know, you would take probably the next part, let's just say far, you'd probably take that in June. You'd probably take um, audit close to the end of that 90 days. So I would say in that scenario, um, and again, it starts to get on a one, one on one on one discussion, but I would say in that scenario, probably pay for two and then pay for two. And then you'll have to just cough up an extra 50 bucks. So, cause I'm trying to avoid you losing the ability to pay for a part and then the, the, the nine months expires on you. So I say that, hello. Oh yeah. Oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm yeah. trying to figure out how to. Well, let's look at it. Let's just go ahead and let's let's do because I'm trying to do this in the air, and uh, that's probably part of what's causing myself to get a little confused. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to search on EGU uh, academic calendar. Okay, and I'm going to go to spring. And period begins January 8th. Okay, now January 8th of 2023 is probably a Sunday. Uh, January 8th of 2023 is a Sunday, right? Now let's say you're taking, um, probably it would be regulation and the first class would be on the 10th, right? Cause it would be, a, these classes run Tuesday, Thursday, but I don't think you'd have to come to that first class because it's an orientation and you'd be, you'd be telling me how to do this at that point in time. So that means that you would still have time before you have to take your BEC exam. So the date that I'm telling you to take your BEC exam is going to be either Friday, January 13th, Saturday the 14th. For metric sites are generally not open on Sunday, but if you find one that's open, you could do it Sunday the 15th. The 16th is Martin Luther King holiday. I doubt that the metric sites will be open then. You might take it Tuesday the 17th in the morning. And then you would need to come to your first actual official lecture for say regulation on January 17th. Okay, so I'm telling you, you would take your BEC exam the 13th, 14th, 15th, or 16th, although I don't think you'll be able to take it the fifth. So it's probably the 13th or the 14th or the 17th is the day that you would take that exam. Now, the period ends February 22nd. And I think summer, yeah, here it is, summer of 2023 won't start until May 7th. But again, you know, you wouldn't have to come to that very first class, say it would be um, far. So let me write this down. So you would take BEC, let's just say January 17th. You would take um, and I'm just, you know, 
making this up. Let's say you took regulation next. You would take regulation. The term starts May 7th. You could miss that May 9th class. So you would take regulation, say May 16th. <clears throat> then let's say you took FAR in the summer term. That period ends August 19th. And I'm just going to use today's date, although it'll be a little bit different, but, you know, you would take FAR September 6th, and then um, <clears throat> you would take the last part, which would be audit, and you would take audit, and I'm going to go back to January 17th, because by then, right, you'd be into fall 2023's term. So that's why I'm saying that you can get this done in a year, but I guess under this scenario, maybe I'm going back on my idea of paying for all four exams. You should really pay, what, for three and then re-register to take that next one if it's not coming until January again where you would be able to actually um, take those exams. Really thorny problem with traditional carpenter. This is a standard bit rate most people are familiar with. This was before the drill of the day. It would be used to chuck a bit in, and this is how you would drill a hole for building boats or houses. The problem is, is when you need to be in a confined space, it obviously has a shortcut. The corner bit brace was designed to overcome this problem. If you need to put a hole close to the floor, that sounds infinitely um, more confusing than what we're talking about. But um, question. No, that, that actually makes a lot of sense. Um, I did have one follow-up question. I saw somewhere, or I saw in NASBA that they're gonna transition the CPA exam in 2024. I mean. Yeah. I don't think that's relevant to us. Okay. Right, because um, we're going to be done in be well before 2023 is even over. Okay. And I would, okay. but I would highly recommend getting it done now because they're going to make some changes. And then if you have partial credits, you know, they'll give you credits for those parts that you have passed already, but you'll have to take any remaining parts under the new format. I see. But I what see that is the new motivation to, you know, to get this thing done more than anything. What, what would the new format change, do you think? New format is going to be that you're going to take three parts that are consistent with regulation, FAR, and audit now. But then they're going to... Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Can you still hear me? My computer's got a bad habit that if I touch a cord, it loses its mind. So don't worry about not seeing me, but you can hear me. Um, and then they'll, the fourth part, which will kind of replace BEC, will be an area in which you choose to specialize. So if you're choosing to specialize, say, in data analytics, then there'll be a fourth section that will focus on data analytics. If you're a tax person, there'll be a fourth section that will focus on tax. If you're a um, audit uh, financial reporting person, there'll be a fourth section that will focus more on financial reporting, but they allow the candidate to, they will be allowing the candidate to choose that fourth part that is in line with some area that they uh, feel they're specializing in. I would highly recommend getting this stuff done before then. Question? Okay, so right now, cause you know, we're kind of focusing on time, you know, pretty far off into a year in advance here. The key date in my mind is January 17th. 
I mean, that's the day you should be taking your BEC exam, okay? Question. And I would say, yeah, probably go ahead and pay for three parts. If you think you can somehow get through all four in the nine months, then pay for all four. Go ahead. I got somebody out there. Um, I'm I'm registered. I'm scheduled to take regulation in November, and I'm concerned that I doubled up for this last quarter for studying two different parts of the exam. Okay, so you were taking regulation uh, this last summer term? No, I haven't taken regulation review at GGU at all. I've been practicing on my own. Okay. Okay, so you were taking regulation in November, um, you know, but we're gonna be well along into the class by then, I, I'm not sure. You know um, what we're what you're saying to me that you're not going to be doing anything in this class until November. I I feel like I've made a mistake trying to you know meet the mark in November for regulation, and then simultaneously sign up to study for Beck. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> under that scenario, I would. They, you know, I don't, I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but you don't have to take this class right now, right? Focus on regulation and then come back and maybe take um, what it would be far with us in the, in the, um, that would be in the spring term. I see. Okay, I, thank you for giving me that feedback. I'm gonna sleep on it and go with my gut and see what, what I wanna do. Yeah, you know, cause I, what happens and I don't, it's hard for me to really articulate this in something that sounds other than sometimes the truth is harsh. Um, I, I, I'm not comfortable having folks, you know, just kind of hanging around um, the class and not putting something towards, um, you know, getting ready for the exam that we're talking about. Um, although I understand that you may be doing um, regulation and that's sort of got your top priority, of course, because you're getting ready to sit for that exam. But by the same token, you start to get into a suspended animation thing where you're studying for one thing, you're coming to lectures and hearing me babble on about BEC. And meanwhile, you're sitting there, I don't care about BEC, I care about regulation. And I'm not sure that's healthy. For either of us. <laughs> I don't think so either. I think I need to clean this up. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other question? Okay, let's do this. I know we're running a little long without a break, but what I want to do, because I think we could probably get out a little bit earlier, uh, I want to look at where you go as I'm assuming there's folks here that haven't registered at all for the exam. Are you all registered already for the exam somehow? Because maybe I'm being no no talking stuff you know already. No. Okay. So let's go ahead then and let's go to the state board of accountancies. Got so many windows open here. And I'm just going to open up another Google window. My wife's put on display here. But let's take a look and you can see how boring I am. Everything's about the CPA exam. But let's just go to the State Board of Accountancy. And I'm gonna to go to applicants. Okay, and this is where you're gonna go. And you're gonna to go to applicants and you're an exam applicant, okay? And you're going to go to um, my exam. Some of those things, by the way, that I have loaded on um, 
e-learning are also located down here, like the handbook and stuff. But you come over and it's kind of hard to see on the screen. It's even hard to see on my screen. It's right in front of me. Um, and if you haven't established an account yet, you're going to click on establish an account. Click on that. And then you just provide them the information. Use the email that you know you will be looking at a year from now. Because this is how they're going to tell you what your scores are and everything else. Okay, so don't, um, you know, don't give them an email that you're using today and then tomorrow you change it because then they're not going to be able to find you for a lot of important things. So you go ahead, you establish the account, you create the account, and then they'll send you an email to that email and they will give you a temporary password. Then you're going to go to access my account. OK, and you'll put in the login, you'll put in your temporary password, whatever it is it'll give you, and then it'll prompt you accordingly to um, change your uh, email, uh, excuse me, your password to a real password. And then you're going to follow the prompts to fill out the application. If you have already met the requirements for the 24 semester units accounting, 24 semester units, you have your bachelor's, then you're going to go under option A. If you plan to follow option C, then you'll follow the requirements under option C. Now, <clears throat> for um, applicants, more exam application they give you a little checklist okay um how to submit your transcripts to the cba do you see this let's take a look at that and what you can do is you can request Paper transcripts be sent directly by the registrar's office of any school. Obtain sealed transcripts and go ahead and turn that in with a hard copy. Um, and turn and you mail those along with your application to the CBA. Or, and this is what I recommend: uh, order electronic transcripts to be sent by an approved provider. And so, what you're going to want to do is basically. Um, look to see that GGU works with one of these uh, approved providers. Does anyone know if um, which one of these GGU uses? Okay, you're going to need to talk to GGU to find out which one of these they use to submit electronic transcripts and have those transcripts submitted electronically. Okay. Okay, so that is the process. That's how you get things started. And as I've mentioned, once you have feel that you have met the requirements to sit for the exam, I want you to do this part immediately, which is start set up your account, go online, do the application, fill out the information that they're asking you for, when they ask you for your university, even though you may have done um, a, an amount of your coursework at another university, please put GGU down as your university. Um, you will be having transcripts submitted though for every school that you plan to claim credit. So if you have some units that you've taken at GGU, even though you indicate GGU as your university, you will have to have transcripts submitted not only from GGU, but also say uh, San Francisco Community College or something like that, where you took some classes that you think would be relevant towards your ability to sit for the exam. Then once you have been approved to sit for the exam, you will then um, get your authorization to test, and that's when you come back to this part of the process, you get your approval, you have one year to make your selection, 
you get your payment coupons from NASBA, the National Association of State Board of Accountancies. And that's why it's important that you have the right email because you'll get that payment coupon in your email. You will pay by credit card. You pay the whatever it was. Now I forget the number, $238, whatever it was to sit for, you know, per exam. That gives you your notice to schedule. You will schedule your exam um, for January 17th for BEC and then so on as you move forward with each exam going forward. Question? These guys are cute, but um, <laughs> they don't give you much detail. You might wanna watch that video, but they don't give you much detail. Question. Okay, so my understanding here is that everyone has received an email from Becker we are going to find out in the next day or two if there is a 4.2 version available for BEC. If there's not, everyone will order 4.1. Um, if you don't receive your textbook in time for next week's class, I will be posting up a PDF of the chapter that we'll be covering next week, which will be chapter one, okay? And we'll start chapter one next week. Um, you need to be registering for the exam, filling out that CPA planning document, understanding if where you stand. If you're not ready to begin registering, why, when do you plan to register, following the questions in the CPA planning document. Make sure you submit that in the next few weeks. Um, that to me is the main takeaways here, but if there are any other questions, anything I left out there. Okay, guys, if there's nothing else, then I will adjourn. I'll be looking forward to looking at your CPA planning document. Oh, if you are also enrolled in audit, you don't have to come on Thursday. If you are also enrolled in audit, you do not have to come on Thursday because it's going to be a repeat of the same thing, unless you feel like hearing it again. Otherwise, I would say don't come on Thursday and I will see you a week from tonight. Question. Well, let me ask one question. You guys hearing me? Yep. Yes. All right. <laughs> okay. it, is that the accounting 111? No, the that's auditing? 380. 111, oh. um, we're going to be doing an introduction to the course for 111, 211 on Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when I'm saying auditing, I mean 380. Um, the expectation is that you're supposed to come to that um yeah, those two live sessions, the one on September 7th, one on December 7th, supposed to come to those, but then they said I should be flexible about whether or not you're supposed to come, but then there's a VA requirement that says that you have to come to some class. They have made it sufficiently confusing that nobody knows what's going on. So, okay, so uh, if we if we call in for the Zoom tomorrow, that's fine for the, sorry, for the 211? Well... Yes, except, you know, there's an on-site requirement, like, for VA mm, requirements, okay. and so I'm going to be sending a third email out now, giving you a contact is to find out specifically what you need to do for VA requirements for the 111-211 class. Gotcha. It's okay. Nice. Okay, but I'll, I'll be giving you some, uh, uh, at least somewhere to reach out to to make sure you understand those. But if you are available tomorrow to come, I would do that. I think that will get you pretty much to where you need to be. And I try to make it to that December 7th one. But tomorrow is going to be going through the re what that class is like. And it's much different. We only yeah. have two live meetings here. We have a live meeting every single week. 
Okay. It's an async, it's a synchronous class. Okay, guys, I apologize for the camera going fluey on me here. Um, that will happen from time to time. But other than that, um, I will see you next week, five o'clock, and we will typically go five to eight. Do not plan to get out early. Thank you. Thank okay, you. guys. Have a good night. Next well. week. Um, cool. Professor Lawrence. Uh, hi, thank you. Yeah. Hang on. Let me uh, pause. Uh, let me stop the recording because I okay. record uh, any specific questions. <laughs>